Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. The extreme power of direct-to-consumer. How one of the largest biodynamic farms in Europe is managing over 2,000 hectares of vineyards, olives, pastures, grain and vegetables and processes everything before selling it directly to their end consumer. No middleman, no shops, fully vertically integrated. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits, and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to a new episode today with Annette Muller of La Viala. We're here outside, as you can hear. We're going to have some, I'm saying between brackets, background noise, but it's actually not noise. It's actually really nice to be on the farm, one of the largest biodynamic farms in Europe, to hear more about the role of investing money and, of course, what has been built here over so many years. So welcome, Annette. Hello. Nice to be here. And to start with a personal question, how did you end up, first of all, here? We're in Italy, in Tuscany, close to Arezzo, and you're not from here. But how did you end up working so closely to the soil, so closely to agriculture and food? So, well, actually, I moved here from Spain, from the Canary Islands. And, well, it's a simple reason for love. My husband is Italian, and that is the reason why we went back to Italy. Working for La Viala, actually, I love nature. And for a long time, I was working and was doing social work. I did meet the Lo Franco family. I just loved what they were doing and decided to be part of it. The Franco family, we, you mentioned them. What is La Viala? And if you had to describe it, which is tricky, obviously, in a few sentences, but what would you say where we are here? Fattoria La Viala is a farm and wine estate. It is a biodynamic, family-owned and family-run farm in the middle of Tuscany. We're about um, 60 kilometers from Florence and about 10 kilometers from Arezzo. And it's really almost like a small, big world because we, we actually, I mean, the way we farm, obviously in biodynamics, we really have a whole a circular economy in the sense that we don't only have olive oil and wine, but we also produce vegetables. We also have sheep for the pecorino, for the sheep's cheese. And the other important thing is that we do everything ourselves in a sense. We grow everything and then we transform it and then we also sell it directly to the end consumer. And so we really always try to, while well, taking nature as an example really, to really try and close the circle. So for example, you know, we have sheep, which we obviously use for the milk, for the pecorino, but we also need the manure for our compost. We also have grains, so when we make our flowers, the remains, the bran that we don't use, we actually add to their feed. And always trying to look that we don't really produce any kind of waste. And obviously doing it in a regenerative way. You mentioned a lot of interesting things there to unpack, but the direct selling I think is an absolutely crucial bit here as well, apart from closing the loops. And I think many people might have, or many, I hope some have visited agriturismo, etc. But this is a very different scale. Like you are not a few hectares here and there making some cheeses and some wines and, no. and selling it in your, with all respect, farm shop. This is a different scale. What, what are we talking about in terms of, in terms of hectares and, and so terms of people? So we have almost 1,600 hectares. Well, actually a little more, including the forest. So we have almost a thousand hectares just of forests. And we have over 300 hectares of wine. We have um, 400 hectares of olive trees, almost, well, 
40,000 plus minus olive trees. We have 800 hectares of fields for grains, vegetable patches, fruit. And I guess the, the one important aspect of it, that it, the way it started, I mean, Fattoria La Viala was founded, this is now the second generation of Los Francos that is running Fattoria La Viala. But when they started out, it actually simply started not with the idea to become this huge um, farm and wine estate, but it actually started as a personal project. Their father or their parents, Piero and Giuliano Lofranco, wanted their children over 40 years ago to have this idea of being close to nature. And so they bought um, a run-down farmhouse here in the hills around Arezzo and decided to put it back into use, you know, with a small olive grove. They wanted to make some olive oil, maybe a little wine, vegetable patch. and For mostly their own use. For yeah. their own use. And then what started as a hobby, they realized, oh, there's another field that has been abandoned. Oh, there's some sheep that nobody's taken care of. And so slowly, La Viala grew. And in the beginning, their idea was to sell the produce here in the area, but La Viala has always been organic. They've never done anything else. It started in 1978. And at the time, people were actually laughing at them here. So what they also did is they had some farmhouses, which they slowly renovated. And so people started coming to spend their vacation here. And those people came from all over Europe, mostly from Germany at that time. And so obviously, there was a little bit of pecorino and a little bit of olive oil that the family was producing. And so the guests started saying, oh, but this Chianti is so wonderful. I would love to have that at my house. And so they actually started packing up a small van, getting the addresses of people that were interested and drove over the Alps and to Germany in that case and delivered by hand everything that they had produced and people had ordered. And so from there, it just organized itself in a way. So the direct-to-consumer started literally by people visiting here for a holiday, staying in one of the farmhouses that happened to be on the land, that they happened to be literally the land renovating and the houses, and then asking for stuff to be sent to them, things they couldn't bring, or when the har probably they came in summer and then exactly. the wine harvest was later, so they wanted to have it shipped. And almost accidentally, now we are at a different scale. You Absolutely. have distribution centers in both Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK, but still a lot of people come here and visit, of but course. a lot of people order yeah. and never come here and visit. Yes. So, I mean, the agriturismo, where people can come and stay at the farm, we have 17 small farmsteads with 33 units where people can actually stay and spend their vacation. But obviously, it's also a way for people to come visit. We have a transparent production area. People can actually visit the fields. They can see the olive mill. They can see the wine cellar. They can taste the wine. They can get a feeling for La Viala. And it's still where the heart of Fattoria La Viala is, is actually that, you know, showing people what we are doing and giving them an experience, which I think is really important. How many people work here now? Just to, you mentioned so, the hectares, but it's, it's, yes. also, it's a big company. Yes, we have over 150. Wow. And not just here, and it's not one estate, it's not just here around Arezzo, you are managing yes, other pieces of land as well. Yes, what we started doing, because we also have a small foundation, the Lufranco Family Foundation, and its main aim is actually to find abandoned land that isn't being used and to then try and lease it, sometimes maybe buy it, and then convert it to biodynamic agriculture. Because you see there's more demand for what you're making, or is, is it both well, getting think, abandoned land back in production, or you also see a growing demand of the well, produce? Well, I think it's both. In a way, it's really being able to restore the land. I mean, we do a lot of land restoration, and in part that also includes using farmland that is just sitting there and the other thing is, obviously, we also continue growing organically, so slowly, you know, we also need more fields to be for our products. What does the, because you said they, everybody thought they were crazy, which is something we've heard many times on the podcast when people are changing farming practices, but it was back in the day when they went organic or they've been organic from the beginning. So then did the step to biodynamic come naturally and what did the, let's say, the local environment or the local community thought about that and then I would like to know what they think now obviously yeah. because so I mean organic was a given I mean they I think the family always I mean Gianni Lofranco he's the oldest of the three brothers always said I mean why in my right mind would I want to poison my land or the food or the fields where I grow the food that I want to eat 
So that would have never made any sense to them. And then in the 90s, that's when they started with biodynamics. And that was more of a conscious choice, you know. Organic was natural, and that's, they have a great grandmother, Nonna Katarina. And she already, I mean, in, in Tuscany, actually, people were relatively poor. So they went with what nature gave them. And so they already started using the moon cycles in terms of pruning their trees and so forth. And um, biodynamics was the choice because they realized that it gave them a certain amount of regenerative practices that were helpful. And also it put basically the farm kind of like a little universe where every aspect of it, you know, the sum of each part is greater than each principle alone. And that there was no market here for biodynamic no, products. Not. And the fact that you were already selling in Germany, the Netherlands and the UK and for people from outside, I think Germany is still one of the main markets for organic and for biodynamic, yes. in, especially in Europe, and that market has continued to grow. So the relationship you had there immediately understood biodynamic and certification, etc. while here in Italy, that's been something of the last years, maybe. that. that yes, yeah. especially because, well, in, in Italy, people were much more skeptical. But then again, I mean, there's a lot of skeptical people still that don't understand the way biodynamic works. And I think it's cuckoo that one puts cow horns in the ground and they don't understand that it's basically just a, a simple farming practice that dates back, you know, thousands of years. It's not something new. No. no, it's not something new. And in a way, though, slowly people are understanding more and more. And also through the foundation, obviously, we also tried to help our neighboring farmers to convert to first organic and then slowly also to biodynamic agriculture by supporting them with our knowledge, sometimes also with a financial contribution. And are you then buying of them? As in, because that also completely changes your relationship in the region as you are having a potential sales channel. And of course, sometimes, yes. And you I mean, we call them like yeah. our friends, far, farming yeah. friends, so to speak, that, that also obviously say, okay, now we did all that, but that, what are we going to do yeah. with the product? So we have, for example, for some olive oils that come from farms that have been converted to organic farming. Now, what's the perception in the region here, especially the nearby ones, because it's not let say La Viala in Italy is not very known because all of the sales goes toward goes over the Alps. But of course, you employ more than 150 people and are an important player here, in, especially in agriculture and other. So, what's the? Are you still the weirdos in on the fields and the hippies, or has that shifted a bit? Well, it has shifted a little bit because you're yes. winning a lot of prizes for wine. Yes. It's not. I mean, the quality. You must be doing something right, not just for the land, etc. Because you've been constantly winning prizes for wine, which is. Probably the sector where biodynamic has, has grown the most because it translates in many cases into really, really good wine. So there's something there that people start to see first, maybe compared yes. to tomato sauce or other. Yeah, the perception has changed and there's actually more interest. And so we do get more requests. So also do maybe some seminars for other farmers. But it also happens that, you know, at a certain point, it becomes more difficult to scale it the way where we get so many interesting projects, we do a lot of research, but then at a certain point you also stop having the manpower to do everything that you are requesting. You're becoming so more than on yeah. your... So, your yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you really only can maintain what you can sustain. And I think that goes for everything in a way. I mean, just the way our food culture is globally right now, we are literally not being able to maintain the lifestyle that we have. And I think it's interesting and hopefully there's always more awareness and a shift in consciousness that people really, in terms of their consumer choices, do understand that agriculture, in terms of regenerative agriculture, is really one of the, the most impactful, positive change that one can make in terms of the climate um, change. Shifting gears a bit to the consumer, obviously, is buying from you. What do you see or have you worked I mean, you, you mentioned the foundation, but in other ways, what's the role beyond our role as a consumer, but also our role as an investor, which could be big or small? Like, what do you see as the role of money in, say, the next 40 years of La Viala, but also biodynamic agriculture or the region of Tuscany and, and agriculture? Do you, are we in that phase of speeding up? And is there a role of finance as you have been very successful, but it hasn't always been easy? It's not that money has grown on trees here for 40 years. Do you see a role for another role for investors instead of just buy our stuff or other stuff from biodynamic farms and hope that it will be enough. Because yeah. that's what I used to say. <laughs> if we just all buy some slightly better food, then we'll be okay. 
I come well, to see that us. Well, would definitely be the first step. And then the second step, I think, is that, yes, of course, it would be helpful if people would understand that there are projects that one can invest in that actually, in a way, speed up the process of regenerating landscapes and regenerating food production and really looking at soil. I mean, soil is such an important part. People always ask me, or a lot of times ask me, oh, why are you, is your pasta so good? Well, it's simple. I mean, it's the soil that, are, that our grains are grown on. I mean, if the soil isn't very good, you will never get food that is delicious, nutritional, dense. It's kind of like you reap what you sow. So the biodiversity and the fertility of the soil is one of our main focuses, actually, at La Viala. And, and do you have those discussions within the company as well? Like, okay, how can we scale up faster or uh, scale up or scale the impact. I'm not saying we should endlessly grow La Viala and occupy all of Italy, but shifting from that mindset of, or do you, do you get those discussions or is it still very much focused? Okay, we, we make an amazing product. We keep growing organically in terms of we get other lands, maybe leased, maybe bought, or is there starting to become, okay, there is an opportunity to the next yeah, 10, 15 it, years to really, because we need to, because we have 10, 15 years left. We're in, yeah. in another huge drought. Yeah. We're in floodings in Germany, the Netherlands and the UK or in, in Belgium. So we are. Yeah, we tend to we, we lean more towards an organic growth because it becomes so difficult to say, oh, let's get another piece of land. But yes, in a way, yes, of course, we're always interested in being able to invest in another piece of land, invest in renaturation of something that is completely degraded. And in Tuscany, there is a lot of land degraded, right? Well, not a lot of land, but there is a lot of abandoned yeah. land still. And now I think slowly there's another shift that people are yeah, going, well, there's, it's kind of weird because there's a movement from younger people that are going back to the land, but there's also an older generation that is saying, okay, we're done. <laughs> we don't want to do this anymore. And so, yeah, for us, it's always interesting to have opportunities. And it's not so much focused only on Tuscany, because the one thing that we started doing, or that actually the founders, Piero and Giuliana, did quite early on, is to also diversify. I mean, we have some vineyards in Sicily. We have vineyards in the Maremma, which is still Tuscany, but still not here around Arezzo. We also have vineyards in the Marche, and the idea is really, we have olive groves in Puglia, and the idea is really to see that we can also, you know, let's say there is a, a natural catastrophe, you know, for a farmer, and that's really horrible to not lose something immediately and lose a whole harvest, but to be able to say, okay, but we still have... Diversifying in terms of, yeah. yeah, one hailstorm can do a lot of damage, but not if you're in Maremma, yeah. which is yeah. quite a long exactly. road from here, and Puglia is and even So that's further. something that we are really interested in. And what we have found, though, is, is really, and I don't know, I think you can feel it when you're especially here in Fattoria La Viala. I mean, after so many years, it just has a certain energy and a feel to it. And what we've noticed, I mean, obviously not for the crops like grains or the tomatoes, well, the tomatoes actually, you do, I mean, they taste so much better and actually they have a higher brick and sugar and are more nutritionally dense because we do measure that. But for example, that our olive trees, olive groves and vineyards are so much more resilient. And I think that is what is important. You know, we've noticed that there's been more droughts, but our plants are actually able to deal better with it. Let's talk about measurement because you brought it up. What, what do you measure? Because you measure quite a bit. Yeah, we measure the soil fertility. We do that yearly. I mean, of all the different plots in order to really see um, whether... So what you measure is the biomass in the soil. And what we've noticed that even though we are farming the land, it actually increases. Which already is not such a, an easy feat to pull off. Then, of course, we do... Um, well, we measure the nutrients in our food. We actually... Every batch we produce, we also do a complete chemical analysis in order to ensure that nothing is in there, is contaminated, since there's always, you know, it's a big discussion how you might be farming biodynamically, but actually things like glyphosate, they're actually spreading. I mean, they're not just going into the water, but they also connect to the sand particles and travel like thousands of miles. So to ensure that whatever we produce and sell to the end consumer is actually completely free of any kind of chemical residues. 
and you do that as well with some stuff you can buy in the supermarket, like the, yeah, we the do colleagues, the, let's say, well, or the, the competitors. It's just we're curious. Cur so we curiosity, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do. We do sometimes also test other producers, not to be, just to see, you know, where they're at. And we found that um, a lot of times some of the organic, organically produced wines or foodstuffs actually are contaminated. Which is very scary if you think about it. And in terms of you measure soil health as well, you've been carbon negative or positive, like on the right side of the scale. Yeah, um, we've been actually measuring our, yeah. our carbon footprint since 2008. Which and is very also, early. Yeah, yeah, and then also slowly adapting because obviously the farm itself, the land itself, I mean, we're carbon positive yeah. because we're able through biodynamic agriculture sequester the carbon into the soil. However, obviously, we do have the whole transportation, packaging, the packaging even though it's glass, but glass is actually quite a, a high impact in terms of CO2 emissions. But so we do the balancing. We're able to, um, some of the as, those aspects we have to compensate. Mm -hmm. But so starting last year, we're actually climate positive. So. Yeah, and you had a, I remember visiting here quite a few years ago in a massive solar panels yes. she'd already up then which for many years has been producing more than enough electricity to to cover a lot here so what would you say because you have an amazing restaurant here or you have an amazing place where people come and eat and for sure people come here on a holiday mindset with their holiday hat on but they might work in banks or insurance companies or they might invest in their own money or their foundation money what would you if they ask because if they don't want to be bothered in their holiday it's a different uh, atmosphere what would you tell them if they ask, okay, what should I do? I understand the soil is extremely important. I visited the farm, I ate the quality and I, I feel and I see the nutrients are different, but now I want to become active. What would your, obviously without giving investment advice, but what would your advice be of next steps? Should you become a farmer yourself? Should you buy something? Well, where should they put their money to work? I think there's already there's it's quite a bit of funds that actually invest in regenerative agriculture and I think something like that can be good. But of course, I think investing like this, but also, of course, your consumer choices. I mean, I think that's the most important thing because so many times people say, yeah, but it's so expensive. But I think there's a whole aspect of true-cost accounting, which still isn't considered very much that, you know, a regenerative agriculture, or in our case, biodynamic agriculture. We do not only create goods that have a certain value, but we also, by sequestering carbon into the soil, we also create a commodity that is a benefit to society and that is never measured or taken into account when you do in an overall price range. Are you looking into or already being compensated for these ecosystem services no. so far? Because no, there hasn't been a market for it. Like the biodiversity, water and carbon are the first, but there are many others that were early there, but there's a lot happening, which could at least in the transition phase, of whatever the transition is, help with that gap yeah. in price of yeah, the very, very I think right very now cheap. what we need is, is more like a shift in consciousness and really people understanding much more the overall connectedness of how, you know, I mean, what the way we consume, what foods we consume, the way we live, and especially in agriculture, it can have such a big impact. You know, if you think about it, one third of all climate emissions, uh, CO emissions, actually come from a conventional agriculture. I mean, one third, that's a high number. And if we could manage to shift that and really shift to regenerative agriculture, I mean, that would already be so helpful and make a big impact in terms of the current climate crisis. So would it be helpful or do you see a lot of opportunity to saying educate between brackets, but the consumer on the bigger picture, the whole picture of buying certain types of food compared to others. Do you, you have a role there, obviously, and you play that very well. You communicate a lot on certain things, on quality, on taste, on carbon, etc. Would it be helpful if many others, would, it, would there be more regenerative, let's say, regenerative food brands that can actually bring the story from the soil to the table? and hopefully get more consumers into it? Or do you see there's enough demand and we need more supply of those products? Both. I think we first need to educate. and But without, you know, I, I mean, it's not our way to, like, raise the finger and say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, but, but kind of leading by example. And, and so many times when people come here and, and sometimes the people that are staying with us, you know, we have, like, a during an olive harvest, you know, we do... Um, 
We give people the opportunity to help us harvest for a couple of hours. And only a couple of hours already people understand that a bottle of olive oil cannot cost three euros if it's extra vergine. Or in general. Or yeah. in general. And that something has to be wrong with it, you know. And, and just understand also the value of the land and how much effort and how much risk and how much what it actually takes to produce, you know, a liter of olive oil or to produce a, a kilo of, of tomatoes. And I think people have gone, you know, in a way, we have the ability to, to have like such a banquet in terms of food, but we've really lost the, the ability to relate to it, you know, how it's grown and what it takes. And I think that is an important piece, you know, and like have a little vegetable patch. You can even put it on your balcony just to go back to really having an experience of seeing something grow and understanding how much it takes actually to bring it to fruition. Yeah, I think it's something we come back to very often also for investors that read the books and looked at the or watched the documentaries, etc. But go and visit a few farms, spend time help if that's possible. In many cases, it's probably not very helpful because you do yeah, more we damage. Have, yeah, we, we get a lot of requests for people to say, we would love to come and work for two weeks with you guys. And that for us, it's, I mean, as much as we would love to do it, it's just not helpful, you no. know, because you have to train them and then you have to follow them kind of and work behind them. But I think, yeah, if I had a lot of money, I think that would be something that I would add to a farm to really have that one aspect where people can really have that experience. Without doing too much damage. Yes, yeah. well. <laughs> You're still making high quality wine, so yeah. it's, it, it's very important to pick the right grapes. Yes. Yeah. And it actually leads to, naturally to another question we always like to ask. So what if tomorrow morning, Annette, or this evening even, you're in charge of a large investment fund. You have to invest it, but it could be evergreen, it could be extremely long term, let's say a billion dollars or a billion euros We're in, in Europe here. What would be your priorities? Well, how would you, not to the exact euro, obviously, but what yeah, would be the I main think, sectors? Well, a large portion I would definitely invest into abandoned land and farming and regenerative farming, but also set up a distribution in a way. I would diversify also. I would probably also invest in, in, in other countries, um, have part of it also be educational, and then definitely also some like some startup in terms of technology. I think there's right now there's such an amazing amount of possibility in terms of startup companies, blockchain technology and things like that with sensors where we're really, in terms of farming, it could be a really good intersection. I don't think you can farm only by satellites Observe. or something like that because I think it's really important to have like the hands-on and the feel for the soil that you're working for the place where you're at but i think there's some really great tools that are being developed and definitely also some money into renewable energies because i think there's still a lot to be done and in terms of technologies something maybe you haven't seen yet being developed what would be the highest on your list like what would you wish to be there tomorrow that would be very helpful for la viola <laughs> is it the nutrient density meter or is it a soil health meter or is it an electric both. tractor or yeah electric tractor would be great <laughs> we're actually waiting on that one and some really being able to measure the nutritional density the amount of nutrients so in terms of watershed yeah, technologies like these that actually help us i mean we already invested a lot we now have really weather stations in all of the vineyards because we found the weather is so unpredictable that it's really helpful to be able to read all the data, even though maybe they're just uh, 500 meters wow. apart. It can go so quick that especially when we're right before harvest, you know, if you see there's a big thunderstorm with possible hail, that you can actually go into the vineyard and harvest it and say, okay, at least this one we saved, kind of. Yeah. So it's a lot of that observing which would help us make better decisions because yes. you're, of course, if you manage a hectare, you can observe everything relatively easily, even though a hectare is still quite large. But if you're managing 1,600, it becomes a whole different, like there are too many variables to start, but it never takes away from the actual observing of the land and the feeling yes, and exactly. touching because sensors go wrong and very often, but to be able to observe that. And then a contrary question we always like to ask, definitely inspired by John Kemp, where do you think 
differently in this sector when you talk to other biodynamic farmers or when you go to conferences and events? And where do you see that you're actually quite contrarian? Well, I can't say that I'm quite contrarian. What I find actually is there's so much information and there's so much new projects in terms of regenerative agriculture. There's so many funds that are looking for projects and then a lot of times these streams don't go together because especially the pioneers and for me Fattoria La Viala is definitely a pioneering farm. It's hard to bring people together at the table because sometimes I feel like okay I mean there's so much information there's so many incredible projects but we still haven't reached that critical mass and if only we managed to bring it all together and be more cooperative And not so much because people don't want to be cooperative, but because farming in itself takes away so much time that it, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, there's so many projects we would love to do, but there's only 24 hours in a day. You know, at a certain point, you have to simply say, okay, let's focus on this one and focus on that one. So, yes, to bring it all together, to have an easier way to connecting and working together. And do you see or do you think that Let's say the original, or not the original, the, the pioneers in the space, the, the original organic players and, and biodynamic players that in many cases have been there for 30, 40 years. Do they get enough attention in the regenerative movement and hype that we're going up now? Actually, yeah, it's a funny, yeah, I was thinking about that earlier, actually, that, that yeah, I mean, biodynamic farmers right now, because... They don't call themselves in terms of doing regenerative agriculture. It almost seems that they don't play a role. Yeah. And I think that's kind of strange, actually, because it is absolutely regenerative agriculture. And they kind of laid the groundwork. So, yeah, it would be good to integrate it more and also have an exchange of ideas and more collaboration. And what could the biodynamic movement learn from the regenerative movement? I mean, they're in the same movement. If you see, is it... The communication, or what is next for biodynamic? What do you see? Is it well, more? Well, I can't more speak animal? for the biodynamic but association, for you, but what, for me, what would you like or, to do or, more? yeah, no. I mean, in terms of the biodynamic association, sometimes I think they do not communicate. I mean, it's it's still there's a certain amount of wording that maybe could be different and still say the same thing and maybe make it more accessible to a broader audience. But I also understand, I mean, if you've been working in this niche for so long, I think it also becomes a little bit more difficult to kind of branch out. And in a way, Fattoria La Viala has shown that you can do that. I mean, the way we do the communication. And for that also, it's incredibly valuable to have this value chain of being able to communicate directly with the end consumer and not have like a distributor in between us. Because we always know when something is great, people will let us know. But when we do something where they don't agree with, they will let us know as well. And it, it's such an amazing, I mean, we really look at our clients as friends. It's more an interchange of ideas and appreciation in a way. I think that's just to underline, you are selling everything directly. There's no distributor, no restaurants, yeah. nothing. Everything goes straight to the end consumer at a scale that I don't think there's anything else. Or at least I don't have an, anything else yeah, that is yeah. so pure and at that scale to yeah. and, and in the, the biodynamic world. And what is next for La Viala in terms of agriculture? What are you excited about? Are you experimenting, apart from the, you're waiting for an electric tractor, but <laughs> apart from that? Yeah, we're also waiting on some sensors. <laughs> and just, in a way, just continuing with what we are doing and really being able to continue to do what we love to do. Do a lot of experiments in terms of the yes, agriculture we practice? Yes, we do. We actually, I mean, in terms of the vineyards, we did a project where we actually took all the different autochthon varieties out of the different vineyards and we put them, we cloned them in another vineyard and then actually vinified each one to kind of see in what way we could integrate them into the winemaking. Then obviously we have the whole, with our olive food water, there's a lot of research being done there because it you know, has 20 times more polyphenols than, than the actual olive oil. And furthermore, but there's so many things we are doing. We are obviously always interested in, you know, in, in biodynamic agriculture, you're allowed to use certain, for example, sulfide in the vineyards and obviously in a much, much, much lower concentration than in, in organic or conventional agriculture, but we are trying to reduce that even more. So we've done some trials, again, with the um, olive fruit water, 
that are very promising, but it's kind of hard. I mean, we've been doing it for the past seven years and slowly also expanding the experimental vineyard, but because each year is a slightly different in terms of the conditions, it's not so easy to say, oh, this is the thing that's going to be the answer to it all. So, like yeah. All, all agriculture research, the variables are so large that it's extremely yeah. difficult to do. And as a final question, if you could change one thing in agriculture and food, the whole food system, if you want to, you have a magic wand, you have the power to change one thing and then ask for more, like, like Aladdin, as some people did. What would that be? What would that one thing be? Ban all pesticides and synthetic chemicals. Overnight. Overnight. Gone. And I think, uh, well, maybe that's a little harsh because I think I would cause havoc. But yeah, I mean, to convert really to regenerative agriculture in whatever shape and form. I mean, maybe biodynamic agriculture, maybe permaculture, maybe integrational. But yes, absolutely. I think um, the world and the earth would benefit so much from that. I think then there's a need for a lot of transition, which is very interesting because it will be a massive... Well, but the thing is, I mean, if we don't start now, if we continue to push it into the future, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I sometimes wonder, I mean, you know, I have children. I, I don't want my children and children's children to live in a world where there is only desert around them. And, and also in terms of the climate change, I mean, we're so close to not being able to even 2%, uh, 2% two degrees of rise in temperature are becoming more and more unlikely if we continue the path we're on right now and we don't take um, some really drastic measures. And so I think, you know, all yeah. time is now. <laughs> banning diesel cars, banning all chemical inputs and get through the transition as soon as possible. It will be rough, but maybe it's a necessary thing because the cost after will be only bigger. Like yeah. every day we wait. Yeah, I mean, the bill yeah, just I mean, if, you, if, if you think about it, I mean, all the changes that are happening currently in terms of the climate, I mean, that was predicted 20 years ago and nothing or very, very little changed, next to nothing changed. And so if we're going to wait another 20 years, I don't think we have a planet that you will really want to live on anymore. No, no, it's the next 10, 15 years. To... Yeah, that are so decisive. Yeah. So I want to thank you so much for this interview. I definitely will be checking in. I think there's a, it's a very interesting moment in La Viala's history and the next 10, 15 years will be also here decisive. Tuscany will recuperate a lot of the greater land and the rest of Italy as well because climate change is hitting hard or not and will be at the driver's seat of that. Yep, I'd love to. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth 
Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.